Hello and welcome to another episode of Pakistanomy. My name is Uzair Yunus and as you can see from your video, if you're on audio, you don't see him. It's Khuram Hussain. He's back on the podcast. He's been on the podcast many, many times, starting with episode one many, many years ago. In fact, before this recording, we were talking about in which episode Khuram said certain things because they will connect back uh, to what we're supposed to talk about today which is that as of this uh, morning, Eastern time, it's Thursday, 2 p.m., almost 2 p.m. in, in D.C., my time, uh, the Pakistani rupee has crossed 300 to the dollar. In the open market, it's roughly 315, 317. In the informal market, it's 320 or a bit more. And by the time this podcast comes out in a few hours, markets would have opened for Friday in Pakistan. And my guess is, and I think Purim would agree, there might be some more weakening in the currency. And a lot of you have been asking on social media, etc. Well, what's causing it this time? Because when the mm -hmm. IMF comes back, things will stabilize, etc. Well, it's not happening. Uh, so what's really going on? And I think um, uh, having a conversation on it that goes beyond uh, what's there in the mainstream media, okay, who's to blame? Was this Hagdar right? What he, was he not right? Should there be a flea float, float exchange? Rate? There's a lot more complication here. And in this episode, We'll try to have Khuram explain to us uh, what, in his view, is causing all of this. And it's, I think, suffice to say, long story short, it's a lot more complicated than what the 8 p.m. news story or beeper might have you believe. So, Khuram, welcome back to Pakistanomy. Always a pleasure to have you on. And let's start with your theory or your argument on this, right? You and I have been talking about this as far back as late 2021, this is a money supply and a fiscal deficit problem more so than anything else. Walk the audience through what your argument is. Okay, thanks, uh, Uzair. Always a pleasure to be here with you too. Um, I think it was in late 2021 uh, when you let me speak at length about the uh, money supply issues uh, within the economy and what, uh, in a nutshell, I had said back then was that they were engineering growth in the economy by expanding the money supply, basically by printing more and more money and pumping it into the economy. And at that time, I was saying that this is laying the groundwork for uh, for, for, for very deep problems down the road. Uh, it's laying the groundwork for a crash, basically. Uh, this was in November 2021. Of course, the economy registered a stellar growth rate in that year, but then... Um, uh, Actually, the year before it had registered a stellar a stellar growth rate. Uh, and then shortly after that conversation, you'll remember, I think in late, uh, in fact, a week later, the state bank had this emergency monetary pol uh, policy meeting. They sharply hiked interest rates in December. They hiked them again in uh, January 2022, was follow, uh, saw um, uh, a sharp devaluation in the rupee and uh, uh, in the exchange rate and, and whatnot. Um, what has happened here, Ozer, is basically that what we had talked about back then, the runaway money supply creation, has continued and uh, unabated since then. Uh, and uh, nothing changed. And as a result, uh, we have, the country has entered into uh, what I am now increasingly worried is a near catastrophic situation. Uh, people say I'm overly bullish, I'm overly pessimistic, but uh, let me just lay out what I mean and uh, and uh, you, you tell me if I'm overstating the case, I hope I am, and uh, things are not the way uh, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing them right now. But nevertheless, um, <clears throat> do a simple exercise. And I've been doing this, and I'll just give you a summary of what the findings look like. Take the IMF staff report from April 2021. Take the staff report from February 2022. Take the staff report from September 2022. And take the staff report from the standby arrangement just signed. Okay, Open all four of these. Go to table five where the monetary aggregates are given and the projections for the monetary aggregates. And put those in a separate table in Excel. So you have one table showing projection of monetary aggregates for um, uh, the as per the staff report of twenty one, another one showing the the same thing for as per the staff report of twenty of uh, February twenty two, and then a third one. So you get four tables, right? Underneath those projections, add another column, another row, and in that row, just add what actually happened. 
Because one thing that has changed between November 2021, when we last talked about this and now, is that a track record has now been established. Right At that time, the conversation was more forward-looking. We were looking ahead to say, well, if this if we continue down this path, this is where the thing goes. Now we've been down that path. We are there. So people are free to go back and look at that conversation one more time and find out what uh, 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 you know was being said in there. Look around you now and see uh, to what extent has that borne itself out. And then do this exercise looking back at the past. Um, underneath the IMF projections from each of these staff reports, just put the actual monetary aggregates for those particular quarters, because they are given quarterly in uh, in, in, in the staff report. And look at the, the divergence. Look at what, uh, you know, what, what the difference is between what was projected in each of these reports and what the actual outcomes were in all of them. And you'll notice something very interesting happening when you do this. So I'm just going to verbally summarize this, but graphs, tables, data, all that is available. What you will notice is that overall broad money supply stays very close to what has been projected by the IMF. It's a fairly tight, close band within which it stays. So, so far, so good. It seems like overall money supply is not really changing that much by comparison to what uh, was projected in these uh, in these staff reports but we both know that broad money has uh, has multiple aggregates underneath it two of those are net domestic assets and net foreign assets to put it in a nutshell net domestic assets measures the amount of rupee liquidity in the system and net foreign assets measures the amount of foreign exchange liquidity especially dollar liquidity within the system now this is Simplifying the picture somewhat, but nevertheless, broadly, that's a good way to think about it. Now, after, after looking at seeing, after you notice that the money supply is about where it's supposed to be, look at the aggregates and plot those separately. Okay. And then you will notice uh, uh, the uh, what you, you will notice where the important divergence is taking place. You see, what happened in each of these instances was that the IMF had chalked out a path of st path to stability for Pakistan's external sector in each of these staff reports. And at the very heart of that path to stability was getting the monetary uh, the equation between the monetary aggregates right. Um, <clears throat> and initially, uh, the path went in one direction, the next time it's another. But nevertheless, each one of these projections represents a path to stability. The IMF was saying, go ahead and let the money supply expand. It's all right. Let it grow. The growth rates, if you look at, they, they give the growth rates in the staff report as well, and they're healthy. 11%, 13%, 16%, uh, you know, often in excess of nominal GDP growth. That's not the problem here. The thing is, the IMF and its path to stability envisioned the growth in money supply coming from net foreign assets, meaning let the money supply grow, but let the foreign exchange reserves, let the dollar liquidity in the system be the drivers of that growth. So if you plot out these two aggregates separately, you'll notice that the IMF is envisioning far higher NFAs that were at that point in time negative they see them going sharply into positive territory and rising and rising until the end of the program where they reach a certain level. And NDAs, net domestic assets, grow much less uh, rapidly. Um, the idea being that let your money supply grow, but let dollar liquidity be the driver of that uh, growth. And eventually, the position between the net supply of rupees in the economy and the net supply of dollars in the economy will bring uh, uh, stability to your uh, exchange rate and to your external sector. At Which, least, if I may interrupt for, for you know, the, the ordinary audience listener, is basically, Joe, we hear in the news there's a shortage of dollars in the market. The IMS argument was, let that inflow happen, and that would resolve that headline that everyone is right now familiar with in Pakistan, which is get dollar in the email. Ra. Exactly. Exactly. Basically. So NFAs were supposed to rise. NDAs were supposed to remain constant. 
Now, underneath that, when you plot what actually happened, and you get that data from the state bank website, okay, if you plot what actually happened, you notice the exact opposite happened. The money supply did grow. Broad money grew uh, more or less within the same band. But net foreign assets were collapsing during this time. They were falling rapidly. And net domestic assets are rising rapidly. What does that mean? It means dollars are, 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 are disappearing from the economy while rupees are being printed and pumped and, and are being pumped into the economy at a growing rate. That's as simple as I can put it, right? Um, so where your money supply growth was supposed to come from dollar liquidity, it instead came from rupee liquidity. And the data shows this. It's right there. Um, and what the other thing you will notice is that in each iteration, from April 2021 to February 2022 to September 2022 to the most recent standby arrangement. The, the correction required in the monetary aggregates gets more and more steep because they say, because you've wasted all this time, because you've pumped in all this additional um, um, rupee liquidity into the, into the system, because you've lost more uh, dollar liquidity from the system, the, the 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 path of adjustment that you now need to take is steeper than it was before. This is there. This is evident from uh, from the data as well. So just ask yourself a simple question: How is the money supply of a country growing at a time when its foreign exchange reserves are falling? Right. So from about September October thereabouts in 2021, the foreign exchange reserves of the country start falling rapidly, but the the broad money supply is growing uh, rapidly from that time onwards as well. Um, that is basically, I mean, in a situation like this, the pressure is going to mount on the exchange rate. There's no, there's no other way for, for, for a situation like this to work out. The pressure will mount. And what is happening throughout is that with each iteration, with each refusal of every successive government, and both governments are equally guilty of this, the, the PTI government as well as the PDM government, I think they were both equally constrained to undertake the steps necessary to rectify the imbalance in the monetary aggregates. Um, they, instead of trying to resolve the problem, they chose to manage it. And they managed it by shouting at the banks, by shouting at the markets. If you remember, these are uh, the, from from uh, April 21 onwards, uh, Shokat Tareen telling the banks, Ke kunda kar dunga tumara and whatnot. That was him trying to manage the liquidity situation and the kind of behaviors it was creating in the financial markets, for, especially where bidding for government debt auction was concerned. Um, the state bank was found selling dollars uh, at, at an increasing clip in the summer of 2021, that's them trying to manage the mounting pressures on the exchange rate. This, the, state, the state bank pointed out this the divergence in the monetary aggregates in its quarterly report, first quarterly report for fiscal year 22, uh, which is there on their website. Anyone is free to go and read the chapter on, the, on uh, money and inflation, monetary policy and inflation, and it says that clearly that um, um, the, the NFAs are falling, money supply is continuing to grow. Uh, and that is the month when we had the first sort of departure from the so-called forward guidance, if you remember, which itself, the forward guidance given by the state bank was itself an attempt to try and manage the situation that was uh, being created as a result of these monetary aggregates going out of whack, the monetary equation going so far out of whack. And then the emergency monetary policy meetings of uh, November and December, uh, followed by the rushed accession to the or the completion of the review in uh, in January, February of 2022. All of these were attempts to try and manage the situation. The <clears throat> attempts to get or the well the successful attempts to get another three billion dollar inflow from the Saudi from Saudi Arabia in December 2021, the rushed floating of a euro bond in January 2022. All of these were attempts to try and rectify the imbalance in these monetary aggregates by finding a way to pour more dollar liquidity into this economy rather than try and rectify the the root cause that was actually throwing them out of whack. 
Um, <clears throat> now, along the way, uh, we have seen the, the management efforts have sort of screened in all directions. They've shouted at the markets, they've shouted at the banks, they've shouted, at, uh, they've uh, uh, tried to uh, artificially uh, control the market by whispering what they call moral suasion from the state bank and telling banks, don't you dare buy or sell dollars above this rate. Uh, you know, the morning rate, as they call it. Uh, they've tried to um, um, uh, borrow money from abroad and replenish the the, the sinking uh, net foreign assets. Um, but it hasn't worked, right? And then along the way, this journey, it's punctuated with these rapid panic-driven attempts to try and adjust, to get onto the path of adjustment. Those are short, momentary episodes when we see a burst of an adjustment. The last one occurred in January of this year, if you remember, and we, and we talked about this at the time, uh, when the currency suddenly devalued after Isaac Dar had spent months trying to shout the dollar down to 200. Uh, suddenly in January, there was a sharp devaluation and uh, and all of us were like, oh my God, looks like they're serious about completing the review after all. But then it halted. So this there was there's been this stop and go pattern to try and adjust, followed by manage, adjust and manage. Um, and uh, all along, the pressures in the financial markets have been mounting. They have been building up, and the distance between where Pakistan or Pakistan's economy needs to be in order to find stability for its external sector and where it currently is, is now so large that uh, I'm very skeptical that uh, even the interim government uh, really has what it take, what it's going to take in order to, uh, to, to, to rectify this. The scale of the adjustment now required is, uh, is, is, is truly massive. And we can talk about that if you wish. Um, and now what's worrying me is that the severely degraded and diluted quality of decision-making at the top, already it's been very degraded and diluted. Every uh, successive government, the PTI as well as the PDM, were embattled, uh, fighting for their survival while these pressures were building up. They didn't have the, the time, the bandwidth, or the, the, the political will in order to really get onto the path of adjustment. Um, now, I don't know, uh, we, it remains to be seen. But what I'm seeing happen now is yet one more attempt to try and adjust to uh, uh, the, the underlying uh, pressures that have choked this economy uh, that are fundamentally monetary in nature uh, to find a way to dissipate the, the pressures that have built up um, by passing them through uh, into the exchange rate and uh, how far uh, this, this is allowed to go, we'll see. And the key turning point in all this is quite clearly the departure of the PDM government, the arrival of the interim government, the departure of Isaac Dar as finance minister, who believed in managing this situation rather than solving it or resolving it, and the arrival of Shamshad Akhtar. Now, it seems Shamshad Akhtar is trying to dissipate these pressures and that's what we are seeing happen on the exchange rate. But the distance that she has to travel, the, the, the amount of distance that she has, that the exchange rate actually has to adjust in order for stability to return is so large that I'm now waiting to see how long it will be before her own government comes to her one more time uh, saying, what on earth are you doing? Can we please cut this out? Uh, because that's what happened last time. That's what happened when Shokat Tareen tried to adjust. That's what, uh, when Hafiz Sheikh tried to adjust, he was kicked out. When Shokat Tareen tried to adjust, he was told, cut this out. When Mr. Ismail tried to adjust, he was told, you're out. Isaf Dar was in. Um, now let's see. Now uh, Shamshad Akhtar is mounting yet one more effort. Uh, but let's see. Let's see how far they let her go. Well, that's, first of all, thanks for that overview, right? And this is something, for example, um, even Amar, when he was on the podcast, tried to explain about how money supply impacts the dollar. It's a conversation that more of that conversation needs to be happening. And I'm glad you sort of dug into the data to make that argument, because again, it's in commonsensical terms, it's quite simple. You know, the price of a commodity is based on demand and supply. The price of the rupee is based on the demand and supply of the rupee, as well as the dollar in this instance, because that's the pair we're looking at. 
Reserves were down, meaning dollar was short, while fiscal deficits were mounting and deficit financing was going through the roof, which as you've shown and looked at the data, the monetary base was growing, which then means ultimately the rupee has to weaken. That's just the long and short of it. Um, but one thing that sort of, you know, to your point on on some Shah Dakhtar coming in and, and what's happening, the 2021 podcast we did, right, that that was our the, the title was something related to the return of austerity, if I remember correctly. Yes. Money supply growth means no austerity, essentially. You know, it's an illusion of austerity because, in fact, you're slowing down the economy while pumping more money into the system. That will be inflationary. It will cause all sorts of things to go out of whack, et cetera. But there's a political cost to this adjustment, as you rightfully said as well. And again, I would like your view now in terms of the political dynamics of this political economy question in the sense that we have a delayed elections on the card. And from all, at least the conversations I've had, the argument being made uh, in Islamabad Rawalpindi corridor is that only if we get another six to eight months of stability we can turn the economy around and then go into elections because people will sort of, you know, forget about the past 100% inflation plus in three years, for example. But what you're saying, and again, this is like this, this issue is like a wildfire, right? It burns through the system and takes a lot of time to douse down. And even after that, the smoke might linger on to give you burning eyes, etc. Mm -hmm. And they really pull it off, even if Shamshad Akhtar does succeed in the next three through four months to put a pause on this because my view at least hypothetically is that the amount of adjustment itself will create the political blowback that they are not anticipating at this point in time because you know it just plays out and it's a vicious cycle in my mind at this point how do you see the political ramifications of sort of assuming the kind of adjustment you and i are thinking about happens what happens in the Pakistani economy, politically speaking? Um, devastation, in one word. It's, uh, I don't normally do this. I don't normally attach values or give numbers, for example, forward looking on things like the exchange rate, because this is speculative material. Um, but uh, um, there, I'll, I'll make an exception this one time. And uh, I am now comfortable in saying that if these underlying pressures, um, especially the sharp divergence between the NFAs and the NDAs in the monetary base and the continued growth of money supply on the back of NDA growth, if these things are not brought under control, um, we will be looking at the rupee going beyond 500 to a dollar in two years, maybe. Okay. Um, I'm thinking about my words very carefully here. Um, and there are two ways in which to bring this under control right now, uh, or a combination of, of the two, right? One is to get the sh a sharp adjustment in the government expenditure side. Um, because raising revenues at this point in the quantum that will be required is uh, uh, not realistic to expect. It's not really something that's really in their control. But government expenditures are. The other is to just pass it all through into the exchange rate. So if you pass it through into the exchange rate, it is possible. I mean, it's hard to say, and I don't want to like get too bogged down in how do you figure, but it is nevertheless possible to see the rupee shooting past 500 in a matter of uh, 24 months. It's possible to envision that at this point in time. It's not an outlandish projection. But if you put all the burden of the past, if you put all the burden of the adjustment on the fiscal side and you say, okay, look, we'll just arrest all government borrowing, you know, right away, or at least halve it right away, you will land up in a situation where the core uh, uh, payment obligations of the state uh, are not being met. And I'm talking about a situation where uh, the government and uh, even the military begins to run a salary deficit, for example. Imagine a situation where soldiers haven't been paid their salaries in three months, for example. Okay, that's not 
a good situation. That's a potentially very, very dangerous situation, more dangerous than any sort of political blowback that we can get. Um, and uh, already the state is running a salary deficit in many areas. University teachers who are, there are universities that are right now literally getting their salary or uh, their ability to pay their salary on a month to month basis. There are some where they have not been paid. There are school teachers that are not being paid. There are many areas where they aren't, they aren't being paid. Pensioners, uh, there are categories of pensioners not receiving their pension. There are issues of that sort already. Those issues will aggravate to a point where I fear uh, for the ability of the state to be able to articulate itself. Um, that is the size of the adjustment that will be required if we place the entire burden on the expenditure side. Uh, but if we place the entire burden on the, on the exchange rate, then we have this other problem. Uh, the rupee shooting to a level where uh, inflation at 70, 80, 90 percent is not difficult. Well, I was to going work. to go there. So let's play that scenario out because I think, again, that to me is the more realistic scenario, right? In the sense of the options on the table. And let's assume, let's not get into where the rupee might go, but let's say, broadly speaking, we agree exponential depreciation of the currency. Now, if I play that scenario out for him, and again, I'm I'm sort of building on your word devastation. It's a very strong word. You don't use such terms uh, just, you know, every other day in conversations, even private conversations with me and others who ask you about these things. But in the event, for example, we run into a problem where there's an exponential depreciation of the currency. Inflation follows. You're absolutely right. It's already at 30 odd percent, goes through the roof again. But then you're in a problem if I'm thinking of as a policymaker saying that, hang on a minute, inflation at 50% into an election cycle means I need to adjust salaries upwards, which then creates the fiscal deficit, which then leads to the same monetary growth problem that you've articulately identified already, which then leads to the rupee pressure once more in another round. So that's to me at least, doesn't sound like a solution because you're continuing to go down that path where every wave of depreciation leads to inflation, leads to a bigger fiscal deficit, which leads to the same round of effects that we've talked about. So how do you think about, because that's devastation to me, but it's not stopping in that cycle. How do you stall it? Short answer, I don't know. I wish I did. Um, right now, <clears throat> I can we can imagine different ways of stopping it, but that's just in our imagination. We can wish all we want. Uh, right now, with the with the severely degraded uh, decision making capability at the top, and this is not something I'm not referring to the interim government here. I'm referring to the state of affairs that has obtained in our country since 2022, uh, if not earlier. But the severely degraded quality of decision making is the most significant obstacle to navigating a path out of this situation first. We can imagine all kinds of solutions, but if the people who are going to be implementing those solutions are simply not there, then what's the point? Um, but what will it take? I mean, uh, you know, if, if, if you look at the staff report uh, of the latest standby arrangement, you'll notice that it's basically a holding pattern. That's what they're putting the country in, including with the monetary aggregates. An important story is being told there. Or uh, in, the, in the previous staff reviews, they sought to bring net foreign assets into positive territory. Uh, the idea was that if they're that sharply negative, turn them around rapidly and get them positive. And uh, by quarter one of fiscal year 24, they were envisioned to become positive in last year's uh, staff report. I'll have to just double check that, but I think they were. But if you look at this standby arrangement that they've signed, they've abandoned that. Right now they're saying, look, just don't go any further negative. That's all it's saying. They're just arrest the erosion of your net foreign assets because the erosion is sharp, it's steep. Do look at these monetary this monetary data when we are done. Uh, just look at the monetary aggregates data in the in the list in the late and you in the latest staff report, and you'll see the divergence where the net domestic assets are going and where the net foreign uh, and the net foreign assets are going, and it's like that you know it's like the jaws of an alligator. 
And all they are saying is arrest the, the erosion of your dollar liquidity for now and keep the growth of rupee liquidity under control. They're not really seeking to reverse this. They're saying just go into a holding pattern. Don't make things worse for now. Apply the brakes. And I think that's how it has to begin. Uh, the process of turn of arresting this uh, growth and momentum. It's pointless now at this point to talk about uh, uh, structural reform and all those things. That conversation now comes much, much later. Um, that conversation needed to have taken place either seven years ago or it will come a few years down the road. Right now, the main conversation is uh, arrest this slide into a uh, potential disaster. We're in a holding pattern for the next nine months, perhaps, till April, May, thereabouts. Um, and the IMF MD has clearly said that uh, if you if Pakistan does not successfully complete the standby arrangement, then you have to undergo a debt restructuring. Um, and that's where the road leads to. And maybe it's not such a bad idea to start working on that now, start thinking about that now. Um, both domestic and uh, and uh, foreign. And of course, this, this is an incredibly fraught and difficult thing to imagine. Uh, domestic banks are already dreading the possibility that something like that will happen. I don't recall when something like that has happened in the past, but you know, when you've had periods of artificially low interest rates, that is in a sense of sort of a forced um, um, restructuring um, by other means, you know, no, that that's that, that that's being imposed on the banks. Um, here, I don't know. I don't know, but I think uh, going into a holding pattern for now, arresting the the further decline uh, in uh, in the monetary aggregates, getting the revenues and making that uh, a big uh, priority to keep those coming, and uh, keeping the expenditures under very 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 tight control. Uh, um, all of these are important priorities uh, for now and um, just prevent the situation from deteriorating any further. Uh, once they, once you reach that level, then you can start talking about saying, okay, what is the path back to stability? What does it look like right now? Fact is, at the moment, the IMF is not even identifying a path back to stability. The standby arrangement doesn't envision that. The previous EFF did. All the staff reports were laying out a path back to stability. This one isn't even doing that. They've abandoned that. They're saying you pass that. Right now, you just need to arrest the deterioration. And uh, uh, once you've managed to successfully do that, it will take nine months, according to the fund. Uh, once you successfully manage to do that, then we talk about a path back to stability in a successor program. So that conversation comes a bit later. And after that comes the structural reforms and all that. I think your point on degraded decision making um, reminded me of a conversation I had um, with somebody previously heavily involved in financial decisions in Pakistan because we were talking about the hypothetical scenario of a debt restructuring, and their view was it 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 will follow, it has to follow as a likely path forward here. To which I asked, well, how does Pakistan navigate that? And they raised the same issue. They were like, even in the best case scenario of all the stars aligning for a country in the debt restructuring process, domestic or foreign, we must ask ourselves, does QBlock have the capacity to not forget about implementing that process itself, but even absorbing the advice of professional experts in that process? And the answer to that is frankly, no, which then means that even if everything else works, which is a big if in and of itself, the decision-making capacity to understand what this means and how to navigate and engage with the citizens of Pakistan in that painful process um, simply isn't there. So I, I just wanted to share that anecdote as somebody else saying something similar to me and your point reminded me of that. Um, last couple of questions for him on this in, in terms of, again, this has been a very sobering uh, conversation in the sense that, you know, we I always am reminded by our friends that whenever we talk about the economy, like, you know, they feel like getting some depression pills right after to make themselves feel happy. This I get is, that a lot e too. <laughs> even I am, I, I'm used to that. And I'm feeling down after listening to you today, which says a bit about how down uh, oh, you personally dear. must be feeling, right? <laughs> but let me ask you this. There is this view now in the mainstream uh, when I talk to people across the aisle, across institutions, 
کہ جی دیکھیں وی ہیو ایس آئی ایف سی سعودیز آر پرووائڈنگ منی ریکو ڈک از موونگ فارورڈ دے وانٹ ٹو انویسٹ ان مائننگ اینڈ ایگریکلچر ان پاکستان اینڈ دیٹ انفلو پلس دی انفلو فرام دی آئی ایم ایف ول یو نو اسٹیبلائز تھنگس اینڈ وی ول بی فائن آئی نو یو ڈس اگری ود دیٹ یو بٹ اف آئی ور ٹو پش یو آن دس لائک وائی وائی ووڈ یو ڈس اگری لائک وائی ڈو یو تھنک دیٹ دیٹ از ناٹ گوئنگ ٹو بی انف because i know kind of know the answer and i'll put that on the table first in the sense that in the scenario where there is significant pressure on the currency itself it would be terrible economics for any investor even a sovereign wealth with fund with a lot of money in its bank account to invest when the value of the currency is a question mark so you would never want to invest which is the biggest issue gorilla in the room here but again would love your thoughts on sifc etc log keh rahe theek ho jayega aap kyun nahi samajh rahe theek hoga um they can first of all i don't disagree with the sifc you want to do it go for it right main mana nahi karunga kisi ko but uh, i'll say this this is not the first time that we've had a four letter acronym paraded before us as a savior and telling us that this is a game changer this is a savior this is remember all the hoopla around cpec was the we've same gone down <laughs> we've gone down in the alphabetical order right now from c to s Yeah, well, I mean, how much further now? We'll have to make an acronym with X's and Y's and Z's after this. Uh, but uh, this is the second time we've had, uh, we're seeing a four-letter acronym coming forward and being told that this is our savior, that we have so many minerals that we start selling those minerals and somehow um, all our problems will be solved. Well, chalo, good. I'm not opposed to mining, by the way. I'm not opposed to foreign investors coming into mining uh, operations in, in Pakistan or anywhere else. Um but uh, it is not a panacea that's the main thing and presenting it as that thinking of it as some kind of a solution to the underlying problems that is the problem uh, not the not the creation of sifc and not the the the, the investment seeking investment in um, in in the mining sector that's not a problem um <clears throat> it's the same story in a sense uh, as cpec except this time it's uh, that that was all money coming from uh, from china and it was going to be a game changer uh, now it's money coming from the oil rich gulf kingdoms and it's going to be a game changer that didn't quite work out to be the game changer we thought and i fact, think sorry to started. if i may interrupt you i think the current chief economist of the planning commission uh, which was appointed by the pdm government at that time had given some insanely crazy number of the percentage of world trade that would pass through cpec oh and pakistan yes. would make tolling revenues and the entire country yes. would be changed i remember that remember that no and uh, the, the figure they were giving was 4% of global trade would be diverted through cpec and then they had gone ahead and calculated tolling revenues based on 4% and i remember asking them that in a public meeting ki bhai how can this be then i remember asking him privately i called him up and said this can't be right do take a look and he called back saying yes you right we actually meant to say 0.4% to which i said ki chalo um decimal point kum gaya tha mil gaya uh but nevertheless i said even that doesn't sound right 0.4% also does not sound right 0.4% of global trade do you have any idea how much that is i mean uh, um But I mean that was built on an assumption that half of, or something like half of China's energy imports will be routed through Pakistan via Gwadar, and somehow we'll pay, we'll collect tolling charges on those. And fair, anyways. I mean, going on about CPEC, it's like beating a dead horse now. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm just reminded of that. Uh, If I may interrupt, just for the audience, total trade in the world was 32 trillion in 2022. 0.4% of that is 128 billion dollars in flows going Arriba. across but that was the Arriba. prediction oh, yeah. so i just wanted to share that number with the audience i mean, I mean the, you know the, the, that's how these kinds of myths get built this is how mirages in the desert uh, are, are built we float out landish numbers uh, we uh, tell ourselves crazy stories about massive quantities of transit trade going through pakistan a big bonanza awaiting us as uh, pakistan connects with central asia etc etc and um, uh, it turns out that all that was really a mirage uh, at the end of the day 
Um, I just hope SIFC doesn't end up that way. I just hope it doesn't. And because as you rightly mentioned, nobody is going to acquire stakes in the rupee, given what has been happening to the rupee over the past two years. Just look at the exchange rate over the past three years. Any foreign investor coming into Pakistan, acquiring stakes within Pakistan, would they want to touch a currency like this? No. So what will they do to secure themselves? They will secure their returns in dollars. They will say our, our returns will be dollar denominated. You're back to square one, right? Um, you uh, uh, Anyways, um, my big problem with SIFC is if it is presented as a solution, as a panacea to the underlying problems that plague Pakistan's economy, then we are creating another mirage in the desert uh, to chase, just like we did with CPEC. But if this is an attempt to just get Pakistan's mining potential tapped and get uh, some foreign investors in here to, to, to do it, fine. Go ahead. No, you know, uh, but be prepared that uh, they will most likely uh, look to safeguard their future returns and uh, will, uh, especially from exchange rate depreciation. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think um, that that panacea or chasing that magic pill has always been the, the problem, right? Again, going back to where we started, if your issue is a sharp increase in monetary supply, money supply, and you're not doing anything to resolve it, it will show up in all sorts of places that will cause devastation. The ultimate devastation, in effect, is inflation. Um, and I have at least have been watching the news coverage over the last couple of days as you know the rupee ins towards 300 and now has breached that barrier in the interbank rate with the same old, same old nonsensical conversation about is Hagdar was right or wrong? Is it PTI? Is it something else? Well, it's not. There are significant. This is the price of a commodity. To understand what's happening to its price, we need to look at the underlying factors that move that price. And as you've explained, we just have continued to pump money into the economy through deficit financing and through a growth in money supply at a time when everything else has been stopped um, in terms of economic activity. And so that is going to show up sooner rather than later in the weakness of the currency and in sky high inflation. Um, and that inflation, as I have been following the data since 2020, has been averaging or diverging from India and Bangladesh at nearly four times the pace. Yes. Um, and yes, you I've know, seen your graphs. And that's it. That is the point here, isn't it? That there's something else to Pakistan's inflation. Because beyond... all the countries import energy. All of yes. them have had climate change issues related to food supply. So they are very similar climate and external shocks on remittances, on other things. But there's only one country with that divergence in inflation. Yeah. That's Pakistan. And that's a money supply problem right there. That's a domestic problem. I mean, when they try to say inflation is due to exogenous shocks, you just have to very clearly ask them in return, well, then why are our neighboring countries that are also being impacted by these exogenous shocks uh, not seeing the kind of runaway inflation we are seeing. Why are we the only one? We stick out like a sore thumb. I mean, average inflation in fiscal year 22 in our region was about 7.5% as per the World Economic Report of the um, of, of, of the IMF uh, for that year. Um, so what makes us so different with average inflation of, you know, above 25, 30%? Uh, in, in in that same year. And what makes us different is clearly something domestic. So what is that something domestic? And my argument is that it's inflation and I, I mean, it's uh, runaway money supply creation, especially how these two monetary aggregates are coming out of whack uh, with each other. And, uh, and I think there are others who think similarly as well. You've named Amar as one, uh, you've, na you've named yourself as another. There are others who, who think similarly. There ought to be, uh, I think, a substantive conversation between the monetarists and, uh, and the exogenous shockers to find out, okay, well, okay, you know, bro, what do you, what, what do you think? Yeah, well, on that note, Khuram, thank you for the time. Uh, appreciate you sharing this point of view. I think it was much needed in this conversation. The rupees crossed 300. It was a good, I think people are paying attention to the currency again, so... Maybe more people will understand uh, the underlying factors and uh, we'll hopefully have you on again soon, as always, in a few weeks or months time to share your thoughts on the economy. But in the meantime, stay safe and uh, maybe get some uppers right after this conversation. <laughs> Good office. 
All the best.